All right. Hello, mate. Going well? Yeah. It's Enjoying good. it? Yeah. Good. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Not a problem. I took some time out of my busy schedule just to come and sit and uh, have good. a chat. So, but what I've, I've got some questions. Yeah. I've thought about this a little bit and uh, obviously I've been involved in the show from the, from the beginning, but I want you to explain, I just want to ask you when this this idea of doing a Billy Joel show started for you? When did it sort of first pop into your mind that that's what I want to do? Literally, mm. as soon as I fell in love with his music, back in the middle of the 1980s when I was 16 or 17 years, I was at sixth form college right. when I heard This Night off the Innocent Man album. And it was an instant thing. I fell in love with it so much. I, all I wanted to do was sing, sing, it. Was sing Billy Joel songs. All the time, all day, all night. I loved it. Couldn't get enough of it. I went around looking for all the albums. There was, a, there was, you know, people at at college who had the albums. I borrowed everything, put everything onto cassettes. I mean, I just devoured it for for mm. not months but years. And of course, at the time, Billy was the only person doing his own stuff. There wasn't like fifteen or twenty other people. There wasn't a Billy Joel show that we could go and watch when Billy was yeah. not touring. So I, in my head, I was going, oh, God, I just would love to sing this stuff. Oh, what a great song. Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd love to sing that. And I was doing corporates with my band, you know, sort of weddings and mm. stuff and or, or corporate gigs and stuff. And I would, you know, where your job is to get up, to get people up to dance, really, after they've had their dinner or whatever it is, you did two or three sets. And I would throw into those sets, Uptown Girl, tell her about it. Every time I was doing, I was thinking, this is all well and good. I'm another gig. Uptown Girl, tell her about it. Great. River of Dreams comes along. Oh, I could throw that in. That was a big hit. That was a nice, people can dance to that and sing along. But there was more to it. If I wanted to do stuff that you can't dance to. You know, I wanted to do Moving Out. Mm. And I wanted to do Good Night Saigon. So the, the, sort of the storytelling songs rather than the get up and dance songs. Yeah, the, the it was lyrically... Yeah, a bit more. because it's just it's just the hits. You can't even do really for the longest time at a corporate gig, can you? Really, no. I like the record, and I just loved all the color, so much color in this songbook mm. that from the very beginning I envisaged a situation where I could do all of these songs and not have to worry about keeping people up dancing. Where I so basically a theatre theatre show concert, a theatre show theater right. concert. So I've carried the Billy Joel songbook idea in my head since the middle of the 1980s when I heard this night for the first time up until up until now it's, it's happening now yeah and how is it um, for you how does it compare to the dream of it that you had in the in the mid 80s the, the reality of it the reality well it... the response we've had from it mm. you see what was weird was that I, I honestly, you know, I mean, I was so 16, 17, 20 year old, 22 year old, 25 year old. You get on with your life. I'm becoming a professional musician. I'm learning how to be a professional musician, making mistakes here, getting ripped off here, you know, doing nice gigs here, getting a nice phone call here, all that stuff. And, you know, it, it was just something that was in the back of my mind. Always envisaged, envisaged doing it. Um, I didn't know in what form it would be. And we tried getting it together. I try, you know, I I contacted agents. Uh, I went to one particular agent who, who had the foresight to say, "You're 20 years too early." You know, Billy's mm. still doing it, but this is a great idea. And it, and I think it's because an experienced guy like that looked around and went, "Nobody is doing this." And yeah. why has nobody ever approached me about a Billy Joel show? He's right. Mm. This is good, but you know what? You're 20 years too early. Um, and so you know. It's a long story, but, you know, we went through a couple of tries and it really didn't bite with the theatres. Nobody was really that interested in booking it. So then when eventually, um, I mean, the catalyst for me was being asked to uh, um, front the reunion of Billy Joel's original touring band that happened in 2013. Yeah. I mean... That was a that was a gig that came out of the blue. Didn't see that one coming. Would you like to come over to America to front this reunion? And having tried a couple of times to get this thing together, 
that's when I went, you know what, let me, I've got to do this. I've got to do it. Here I am, you know, uh, you know, mid 40s at the time, whatever it was, thinking still nobody is out there doing a Billy Joel concert. Yeah. They'd done Moving Out, the uh, Broadway show. Yeah. Uh, which was which was a dance based thing. It was a ballet. Mm -hmm. It was a great band playing at the back there, but it wasn't about the band. It was more about the story that uh, Twyla Tharp had put together through Billy Joel's lyrics, and it was a ballet. That wasn't what I want, obviously. You know, I mean, I can dance, but you know, um, <laughs> but no, I wanted to. Can we cut to something there? <laughs> some sort of old footage that I've got. Um, I just. So no, so I had this like this thing, and uh, I approached Barry Collings, Barry Collings Entertainment, and uh, he went, yeah, yeah. I mean, I bet in all of his life, this is a, an experienced uh, agent, booking mm -hmm. agent, theatre booking agent. I bet he's never ever been approached. I bet no one's ever been approached to put a show, a Billy Joel to, show. A show, a Billy Joel show. I didn't answer your question though, did I? No, it's all right. I'll okay, get. I, I was aware. I'll get back. I'll get back on it. Right, so um, so it's a theatre show, right? Yeah. Uh, you had the idea, you wanted to, to front it, do the songs. And I know this is important to you, and it's it's the f f for me, seems to be the thing that kind of... You always have to explain yourself again. It's like, ugh, not again. This isn't a tribute, right? So this, is, this isn't... There's no American accent, there's no sound-alike, no dark glasses, all of that stuff. What? How do you get over that? How do you how do you sell that? How did you how did you? Because people instantly want to say it's a tribute to Billy, mm. which it actually is. Well, it's a tribute. That's, it's that's in what the, in I the was going to say. Sense, right? Yeah, because tribute never meant imitation. Imitation. Tri you look it up in the dictionary. It doesn't say tribute to imitate somebody. I have no problem with Elvis. Yeah, jumpsuits and sideburns and people being Freddie Mercury with the moustache and and the. But you haven't chosen to do that. No, because and, well, and one because I'm I don't think I am an impersonator. I don't. But to sell that, to sell, it's one thing doing that right. in your own right or at, or at gigs or whatever, yeah. you know. But to sell that to a theatre and say no, 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 it's not a tribute. Yeah. They're used to getting Aber and yeah. Elvis and yeah. David Bowie, Queen, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So making the decision, this is just going to be you, Elio Pace, that is doing this. Yeah. Is has that has that held you back? Has that been a problem? Has it been mm. a because I know it's important to you that it's it you doing it. It is, it, yeah, it is important, and you know, thankfully because of wonderful people like Sir Terry Wogan, mm. who uh, who opened incredible doors, who put me on a platform for the nation to know my name. Um, I, I used my name on the poster because I wanted it. I want that was my first step to saying this isn't an imitation. This isn't. I was hoping that by because you see a lot of those posters, yeah. they don't they're not named. They don't have names on them, no. you know, like like um, uh, Frank and 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 David and so and so are the Beatles, yeah. you know. So I wanted it to be that people who had heard me on radio and and, and seen me do that stuff knew I was that guy. It's that guy. And he's doing. Billy Joel. Well, obviously, he looks a bit like him. I, I can't, well, sort of, you know, well, I actually normally look like Elvis Presley, but, you know, so I choose to put the weight on and the hair off. But, no, I I, I look like him a bit. And so they, I suppose people seeing that poster are going to go, oh, is he, is he, you know, and, and, I, and it is a tough thing. Yep. Because selling what we were doing is, is very, was tough. Because people, first of all, had never seen the words Billy Joel on their local theatre's poster board or in their brochure. So they didn't know what to expect. Yeah. Oh, so there's a Billy Joel show here. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Instantly, you will think, possibly, that this is a tribute. It's a tribute, yeah. A tribute in the sense that it's now come to mean. So it hasn't. you don't feel like it's held you back? You don't feel like... I know you do a lot of radio interviews when you go on tour, but yeah. do you, are you always able to no, explain I found, that? Or yeah, you, I am. I'm always yeah. having to explain it. And still, although the message has started to get out now that, that there is a different type of tribute yeah. show, real tribute, you know, uh, not imitation, but a real homage to somebody. Selling this show was tough. Um, uh, but as I say, I think, I think um, 
when people come to see it, obviously, what's happened? People come to see it. It doesn't matter. Exactly. In that first year, when in some theatres we were playing to 35 and 53 people, you know. But those 53 people went and told four people. So when we came back, we had 200 people. When we came yeah. back again, we had we were doing two nights. We were sold out. So people got to know, got to know that this is a, it's a different type of, it's, you know... I always say people like Gary Barlow, you know, if Gary Barlow had done it, mm. if, if, if Gary Barlow had said Gary Barlow or the, the Barry Manilow songbook starring Gary Barlow, I don't think anybody would think that Barry, Gary Barlow was going to impersonate sorry. Barry Manilow or Neil Diamond or, or Billy Joel. So it is a tough, it, it, it's difficult because I'm in yeah. that category where some people know who I am, some people don't. And you see a poster of a guy that looks a bit like Billy Joel and they've never seen anything with his name on a poster. So, yeah, it was it has been quite, mm. quite a hard sell. So uh, I was there. You got the call, uh, the email from um, uh, Larry, Russell. Larry Russell, Larry Russell, right, uh, to Dear come Larry. up to go over to uh, America and fill literally fill Billy Joel's boots. Yeah. Tell me about that, because that must have been. I know that that kind of kick-started our conversations during yes. that. Um, and I was there. I went over there with you, New York and Philadelphia, watched those gigs. It was incredible. How did that feel, taking on that that role, really? Um, one of the most exciting... In the heart of it. One of the most exciting, exciting things mm. I've ever done. I've been inspired by lots of things. I've had fantastic experiences, but that was... How do you explain, <laughs> yeah. you know, try a British try. Italian being asked by Larry Russell, who was Billy Joel's very first enlisted musician mm. as a solo artist. When Billy put his first road band together, Larry Russell was the first person to get the gig mm. on bass. He calls me. We're doing a reunion of that original band. We have a guy wonderful guy called David Clark who uh, is doing it as well um, but we'd like to split the set up and the, you know we've, we've seen stuff of you on YouTube and um, would you like to come over it was just incredible it was an absolutely incredible incredulous that that I would find a path to that thing to fly over to New York yeah a Brit Italian singing Billy Joel songs to American New Yorkers, people. To New Yorkers. In New York. Yeah, absolutely. In the it, hot seat. In the hot seat. And at the bitter end where Larry, along with Reese Clark and Al Hertzberg, who were the original touring band, um, and unfortunately Al Hertzberg couldn't do these reunions. They enlisted Don Evans, mm. who was Billy Joel's, guitar player on Billy's first album Cold Spring Harbour and there I was at the bitter end playing a Yamaha grand piano that's been there since 1971 that Billy had played with them in this club mm. yeah I mean you know we could sit here for hours telling you how excited I was I was probably the most excited I've, I've, I've ever been really about playing in America is you know mm. I mean I, you know, American music has played such a massive part yeah. of, of of making me who I am. So just going to America mm. to play music that I absolutely adore. I mean, it was it was a dream gig. And it's sort of it's at the time I remember it seemed to sort of kickstart that yeah. idea of of well, going for this show and, and writing this show and I remember talking to you about make, it. Making it making it time. happen because it it, it sort of it kind of came out of nowhere that offer and it just all sort of happened at once and it was so incredible. It was so brilliant. Yeah. And it just worked. And I it, and, and I know for me sitting there watching it and and watching you doing that, it really did feel like, hang on a minute, this yeah. is, this has to mean something. This can't just be a gig that I walk away from and thanks very much. Good night. I, I, I remember seeing you there in the bitter end, seeing you in New York and you'd come over to see it, to support it. But I, I know I'd already mentioned the Billy Joel songbook mm. to you and I was so glad you were there to soak all this up because I knew what was about to happen was yeah. when we got back I was going to say to you mate come on 
No, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. I've, I've wanted to do this for over 30 years. Mm. And I know that you're a massive Billy Joel fan as well. And I knew you got it and you'd been there to experience it with me. So, um, and we've been mates a long time and we've written stuff together. You know, we've written songs together from What A Day to Can Your Grandpa Rock and Roll Like This for Albert Lee. Good songs. Yeah, you know, and you and and can't can't get down and lazy days on my debut album, and uh, and you as an actor in your own right and as a writer in your own right, you know. <laughs> Keep going. I could do the shouting men. You should watch it. No, but no, but but I mean, you know, where do you find a mate who has all that skill and also loves? When I was throwing songs at you, worst comes to worst. Yeah, I love that. You know, when I was... All about soul. Is that, all about is that <laughs> it's one of your favourites, I believe. It's one of my favourites. I know it's why he's bringing it. Actually, You're bringing it up because it's actually not one no, of yours. No, it's terrible. But how do you, that's a good point, actually, because uh, that's another little thing that I, uh, we talk about. But uh, there's, what, 38 songs or something in the in the show. And still, people come up and go, oh, you didn't do I know. Leningrad. You didn't, you didn't do, do yeah. Sleeping With a Television yeah. On. Yeah. Or... All about yeah. soul. Yeah. What? What? Why don't you do them? Why? Why? What do you say to people that are upset that you didn't do all of Vienna or all of? Yeah, we would be there for ten hours mm. if I tried to please everybody and did them all. What I also remember thinking to myself: What I remember us discussing this as a concept. I don't want to do medleys. Yeah. I don't want to go, I don't want to do a verse and a chorus of, uh, of a, a matter of trust and then slow the band down and go beautifully into, yeah. you know, street life. Just serenade. for the sake of yeah, adding just to bring six a, yeah, or seven songs. Exactly. There was something about the Billy Joel thing that even though, yes, some of the songs we've had to cut down and reduce, but we've mm. still got the essence of the song over, I believe. What I didn't want to do was put medleys together. I've got nothing yeah. against medleys. You know, a good medley is yeah. a great medley, you know. But it was not the vehicle that I wanted to put this show across. It would be easy to do that as well, wouldn't it? Just just do a yeah. ten-song medley just for the sake of... Yeah, all ballads. Here are some of my favourite ballads of and it's Billy hard, Joel as a medley. It's yeah. hard as well because you've got... His songs are not just songs that you put on in the background and they're on. They're, the, the lyrics that are in them and the, and the, the meanings and the stories... Yeah connect with people and there's so, there's so many of these songs connect with people yeah. for different reasons yeah. and that seems to be the thing that car that carries along with people is yeah. that they want to hear a particular song because it's they've got an, an attachment or exactly. an association to it yeah so it's it's part of them part yeah. of their and you remember and so many of them are like that when we were going through mm. those 12 albums and thinking about the songs and which one would go where and which one do we cut you know where mm. you know we you know do there are some songs, scenes from an Italian restaurant. It's, where do you cut that yeah, and, you and lose the? You yeah. lose. Even we didn't start the fire, which is a chronological, you know. Leave out, leave out a decade. Let's leave out a decade <laughs> exactly. And it's not a bad idea. I, I, you could, <laughs> could get Leningrad in. Weave that in there. Could do. Segue <laughs> out of that into Leningrad yeah. back in. But, um, and I know to most people, they wouldn't care. If we did leave out 1962 to 1969. Someone would. Yeah, I someone. would. No, but I would. I would. And I remember us going, what would we want to sit back? Yeah. I think that's the crucial thing about, you know, and, and Billy was the guy that I remember hearing saying it for the first time, is is write to please yourself. Hmm. Create to please yourself first. If other people end up loving it, then it's a bonus. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible bonus. Mm. And that's exactly what we tried to do, that we we went through all of those songs and went, well, OK, you know what? We can take a verse out here of, of Moving Out. We've still got Sergeant O'Leary and Mama Leone story. And we yeah. can, you know, and, and there are ways you can cut. And of course, I did that because I wanted to cram in more Billy more Joel songs, songs yeah. without using the medley vehicle. And you're also doing uh, you're doing songs that he never does, never does live, hasn't done yeah. live. You'd never ever or, or done them once. Yeah, done them once somewhere that, that yeah. you know. Um, so you really are putting on a concert that that people will never get to see him do. You know, uh, at some point, if you had some 
private home movies or whatever of him doing songs. Put but you wouldn't actually ever see him live doing the songs that you're doing. Yeah. So you're actually keeping it alive in a in a in a in the real sense. His, his music and and those some I'd of those like songs. I'd like to think so. It? Yeah, I'd like to think so. Um, yeah, we wanted. Of, of course, it's what I wanted to do with the show was to draw people into hearing how incredible this man mm. was as a single songwriter. I say was only because he obviously doesn't want to write any more pop music. Uh, 24 years has gone by or something. Yeah. But um, I wanted to draw people in, so I didn't want to alienate them and, and do a show that full of songs just literally to please me. Every song we do... Even the ones that you think, ah, oh, surely, you, you know, because of people sort of, ah, oh, you don't like this. You've already admitted, admitted you don't like, you know, All About Soul. I actually really love it. There isn't a single song in the show that I don't love, including mm. Uptown Girl mm. or Piano Man, you know, even Captain Jack, which Billy himself says, uh, you know, goes on too long, you know. Um, no, there isn't a single song in this show that I don't absolutely love listening to or singing and performing. Mm. Um, but I also, so every hit, every major hit is in the show. I thought of it like a commercial show. I didn't want it to be, you know, a, a specialist little cult show. I wanted it to be, bring everybody, yeah. bring everybody to this, bring your kids to this, bring your grandma, your grandpa to this. Which is happening. Hit. You are getting audiences that are... Unbelievable. Young and old. Yeah. Little kids singing the, the words. I know. And, you know, who who came amazing. along the first time because their parents were Billy Joel fans yeah. and they brought their children along from seven-year-olds, 12-year-olds. Yeah. And then they come again and because they loved the spectacle it's of seeing the, a live, live band yeah, and, all of that. and the fun we have on stage, the next time these kids come along, they're, sing, they're singing the words to We Didn't Start the Fire. And it's amazing. And then I meet these people afterwards uh, and they say to me, they're doing piano lessons now. Or they stopped taking piano lessons and because they've come to see the show, they've started piano lessons again. We've got the root beer rag up on in right. front of the in front of the, on the piano. I know. It's all been know. worth it. it. It was oh yeah, it's been it's amazing. It's a, it's an honour. Because, you know, as you know, I I, I do I I said I've said I say it on stage every single night, but I think he's the greatest. Mm. I think he, Billy Joel's Songbook is the greatest. Taking nothing away from all those other incredible no, songbooks, but it for just me, it covers the, everything. It, it does, and it's so clever musically. Once you get your hands on it as a musician, you and musicians love his music yeah. as well as people who don't make understanding music their business and just love it coming out of the radio. Mm. They love it too, but musicians love it too because you go, that is such a clever chord change. What a, and 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 to be able to condense it down into three minutes, three and a half minutes, you know, yeah. it's um, yeah. So doing this has been has been the single most satisfying gig, yeah, of my life. So um, I know that uh, you talk in the show about different parts of Billy Joel's career and different songs and where they came from, but the um frustratingly one of the things that we've sort of condensed is the um just the way you are uh story yeah yeah uh well the story i tell as you know because we, we designed it this way that we'd we'd want to it's not a life the life of billy joel mm. but there are some such incredible things to think that this guy very nearly didn't make it yeah very nearly didn't make it. And as I say, I love the idea of being the storyteller, telling people who come along to see the show stuff that they may not know and it, and it lights up the music in a different way. Yeah, Billy, absolutely. Billy's too modest to sit there and keep telling you how he very nearly didn't make it or how he nearly got dropped or how he did make it. He tells this story, but he tells it in his typical, you know, self-effacing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well... I didn't want to do that because I, I think it's I think it's important and I think it's a lesson for those twelve year olds who are thinking about becoming a musician. Uh, you have got to want it hmm. because if you don't, if you're not if you're not made for it, it will eat you up. And 
And Billy had the tenacity to keep on going. And when it came to it, he came up with the goods. And that's tough. You know, um, he was in an era of singer-songwriters that were, you know, Elton John was a huge star, James Taylor, Joni Mitchell, huge, huge stars. And Billy, there he was. He was doing all these incredible, clever stuff and an amazing piano player and a funny performer, great with the audience. And it, he just wasn't hitting. He wasn't just wasn't latching on mm. with the with the with the. It's, and he was signed to a major label who were pouring money into him. And then Phil Ramone comes along and and says, uh, "Here's your hit. There's the hit we've been desperate for. Here it is, just the way you are." And he's like, oh, "I'm not really sure about that song. I've tried it a few times. It's not that great." live and you know he said really i think we should work on this as an arrangement we'll, we'll change the arrangement you know what the drums are doing needs looking at and you know just mm. we change the arrangement and um they went for it and they did a session and uh they created just the way you are the song just as we know it for the stranger album for the, for the making of the stranger 1977 billy had made three albums by this point uh, none of which had sold that much, and he hadn't had a hit. And these albums, like, had Piano Man on there, New York State of Mind, The Entertainer, Summer Highland Falls, yeah. You're My Home, beautiful songs. But he hadn't had a hit. And so they worked on Just The Way You Are in the studio, and and Billy still wasn't sure whether it was good enough to make the album, The Stranger. And then The Twist of Fate comes in. Phoebe Snow and uh, Linda Ronstadt, were in the same studio in New York making their albums. In they came one day, meet the boys, meet the band, listen to what we've done for The Stranger. And they heard Phil Ramone played them just the way you are. And they absolutely loved it. And they were like, you have got to put this on the album. You've got to put it. And Billy, to quote, <laughs> even though this is slightly politically incorrect these days, but to quote, he said, well, if the chicks like it, we'll put it on. There you go. And he did. And it earned him his first two Grammy Awards. It was covered. Barry White did a version of it. It was a massive hit. Mm. People all of a sudden l learnt who this fantastic yeah. guy was. And from then on, hit after hit after hit. 52nd Street album, My Life, Honesty, Big Shot. Then came... Uh, um, uh, Nylon Curtain, yeah. Good Night Saigon, Allentown. Then came Innocent Man. Innocent Man. Bang. Uptown Girl. That's it. He, at one point, when Uptown Girl was out, Billy Joel was probably the biggest star in the world. Yeah. But it was that close. It was that. It's close. horrible. It's a horrible. Uh, it's, it's that sliding doors. Uh, yeah. Moment yeah. for him. What would have happened? And again, as what I'm saying, you, you've, he's not going to sit there and go, it almost never happened, folks. This, if it hadn't have been, for, he's not going to tell that story. Mm. But you're right; it does these just these little insights during the show. Uh, it just colours that song in a different way, and you you walk away from it and go, oh my god, you you hear it with different ears yes. forevermore. Yes, and do. and that's really important, I think. I mean, people write biographies about you know, but unless you read it, you don't yeah. really. Yeah. But but this show, you really are getting. And the stuff with the classical music and the, the yeah. all of that, you're, you're just those little insights into him. Yeah, it really does raise everything a little bit more, and and the appreciation of him. And well, I think and I'm it, sure people go away and, and well, I know they do. But personally, I know uh, everyone that I know that's seen the show. They've got his albums, but they go and get the rest of the albums that yeah. they didn't have, or they they, they change their playlist the slightly and yeah, put the exactly. things that that, that yeah. they've now heard live that sound incredible. Yeah. That they'd overlooked, and now an album track, and so. now they go home, thinking about Billy Joel, not as that rock star they saw on MTV once, but as a human being, yeah, a guy who who slaved away, who had to work hard. You know, in our business, so many people say things like, "Oh, what a lovely life you have!" Oh, how glad. Yeah, it isn't glamorous, folks. It's not. There are some beautiful moments, but it's hard work. Yeah, and uh, we're not all lucky enough to be. But blessed with the with the gene that Billy Joel has to write pop song hit pop song after another, 
But it is hard work, whether it's touring, whether it's the traveling, whether it's yes. keeping yourself fit and healthy and inspired and and uh, um, keeping relationships together with the band members you are. It's um, over years and years and years. It's tough. Yes. And, and, I, and what I feel is important is to help the general public see people like Billy Joel as humans, mm. as people that have to work hard, that can suffer immense highs yes the suffer immense lows after these incredible highs you know and that's what this industry is like if you're doing it for the right reason yeah. which i believe billy was he's one of the people i believe was doing it because he loved he loves music just really loved music he's always said he wasn't interested in being a, a superstar he didn't want to be on camera he didn't you know he felt mm. comfortable behind a microphone in a studio that's where he felt he came alive. Mm. He didn't want the all the all the trappings of fame. He got yeah. it, you know. But yeah, exactly. um you know, he's a human he's he's a guy who I was suppose a he, great he had musician. an all good audience as well, his audience of New Yorkers that he knew he could tell a story in a song and they would listen. Yeah. And that that's a, a nice position for someone to be in rather than just having to write a pop song that's gonna jump out of the yeah. out of the radio. Yeah. He still he still had a a platform of people to write for in a way that would that were that were ready to he, hear his hear his songs like a folk writer. yeah exactly he's exactly. a folk writer yeah. he writes for folk mm. and he and I would say what the majority of it is about his folk as you say yeah. the people he grew up with the streets the towns I've learned my geography I've learned through Billy jo the, my geography of New York I've learned through yeah. you know where Sullivan Street is and and Mulberry Street yeah. is <laughs> you yeah. know and, it's uh, true. Mr. Yeah, Cacciatore's, all... you know, just, it was, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, he, he's a folk writer and a folk writer who obviously came from this classical background, fused those, you know, the love of classical music and then his love of rock and roll, which he got because of the Beatles mm. and his ability to do it, his ability to take the engine apart. He, know, he knows what's wrong with this. I can fix this. I can do that. Oh, what's wrong? I know. I've got option A, option B, option B, option C to fix this. That's an amazing position for a, a, a pop star yeah. to be in. And I think that's what sets him apart because I don't know another pop star that has, has that vocabulary, mm. that palette, who can write, perform, sing, uh, play, yeah. produce, arrange. And, and, and be able to grasp into, look back into, so have so much knowledge of music that he can go, oh, I'll make this one. You know, I mean, he was criticised, right? He even said himself that he found versatility to have been a curse mm. in his life. is not that a shame mm. that he wasn't allowed to be versatile? He wants to, you know, and, and, and then being criticised for being derivative. Well, everyone's deriv derivative in a way. And... And I think it was, I think it was, uh, I can't remember who it was, but somebody said, uh, said, you know, the good musicians, oh, I can't get the quote right, but it's something to do with, with, uh, you know, the best musicians steal hmm. and make something their own. Um, Beethoven learnt from Mozart, Mozart learnt from Bach, and so it goes. So Billy could good write. Song. <laughs> Why don't you do that one? Oh, you do? A snippet, a snippet, a snippet. <laughs> um, he, um. You know, he could he could write stuff that sounded like from the sixties. He could write yeah. stuff that sounded like Elvis. Then he could write stuff that sounded like James Brown. And I'm not even Love sure it. that people noticed at the time that it was a different genre that he was singing. You know, no. if you from one song to the next, you didn't you didn't you just loved it. It sounded familiar, and you you yeah you felt it coming yeah. out of the radio yeah. or whatever. But yeah. I don't think people clocked that he was just jumping around genres that had inspired him. Yeah, you know, and again in the show you 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 present that and you, you understand it more from the audience's perspective yeah. that, oh my God, these songs really are, yeah. you know, the, the Frankie Valley bit or the, the, uh, the, yeah, know, or the, the classical the, bit, or the, the this, classical is, this bit, is the, yeah. this is the Chopin bit. Yeah. And here's, here's Wilson Pickett. Yeah. It's yeah. incredible. I know it is incredible. And I, we absolutely carefully crafted that set list. So, we had a lot of criteria, didn't we? Mm. We wanted to make sure we didn't alienate people, but we wanted to make sure that the diehard fans came along and got something that they'd never heard live or, you know, or only seen videos of playing live or a song they've never heard live. Um, 
And we also wanted, I wanted to show people why I do say that I believe he's the greatest. I wanted to prove it. It's like having your iPod on shuffle, yeah. listening to well, Billy yeah, Joel. Exactly. And I don't think that is a bad thing. I mm. don't think that being versatile should be criticised. I don't. It's a shame that the record industry needs to bag you up. Mm. You know, so the story says he wrote the the Stranger album because it was such a massive success. The record company said, "Can you write another album like The Stranger? Just yeah. do another one." You know, when Innocent Man was, can you do Innocent Man? Stranger 2, he calls it. He's like, no, I've done it. I've done it. Well, I'd like to, as a musician to move on and, and move on to the next stories I'd like to tell. Him, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, these are all the reasons, and many, many more are the reasons why I think he's the greatest. Mm. And luckily for you, you've got, the, you've got the chops to be able to cover all those genres yourself wow. and play all that stuff and sing all that stuff and get it all across in the way that you do, that's that's packing out theatres. Well, so you've got to be I lucky in glad some ways. I taught you <laughs> the piano. I'm glad you taught me the piano. Yeah, You're welcome. The, the prelude, angry yeah. young man. It's not nah, easy. You, you know, I um, if someone said to me, "Would you like to do a show about Stevie Wonder?" I adore Stevie Wonder, but there are people in a much better situation to be able to to put that across if you want to hear it like Stevie Wonder mm. I suppose you know it's the chicken and the egg thing what I, you know did I did I become proficient at doing Billy Joel because I fell in love with it so early and it influenced and shaped who I was or was I always destined to be looking like this and playing like that and singing like this yeah. I don't know all I know is that I um I thank my lucky stars that uh my ex-girlfriend gave me the wrong tape, Ac you know, by accident. <laughs> <laughs> and that I discovered this guy because this guy, uh, as a writer, as a performer, as a singer, has influenced me more than anybody else. I've learnt so much. It's like an, a non-stop masterclass after masterclass after masterclass in all the areas of arrangement, writing, mm. producing, singing, performing, attitude, yeah, you know. So I know the story, obviously, um, but the tape and Katie and <laughs> that little that little twist of fate that yeah. set you on this Billy Joel road. Right. I'm gonna go and make a cup of tea. <laughs> Do you know what? Away. I can remember almost every single detail like it was yesterday, because it was such an incredible. My first proper girlfriend, the girl I fell in love with for the f proper first love, is a girl called Katie Stevens, uh, who uh, has turned into one of Britain's most fantastic actresses. Um, so you should look her up, uh, but she's phenomenal. We went to school together, Toynbee School, in Chandler's Ford, in Hampshire. She was my first love. She dumped me, and uh, it was my fault. And um, but I, two things happened at the back to back. One was that I, at that time, I was sixteen or seventeen years old. So I just left Toynbee and I'd just gone to my sixth form college, Barton Peveril. And two things happened. I got a job offered to me to play at the Potter's Heron, which was a local pub, uh, Fridays and Saturdays, I think it was. Uh, I used to borrow somebody's Fender Rhodes piano and some speakers on a stand with a little amp, microphone, put it into the back of uh, a car. My lovely friend Wendy would uh, drive me down in a maxi to the Potter's Heron and I would do this gig. At the same time, me and Katie's relationship came to an end. So I needed to learn some new songs for this gig. And I thought, wow, that's two nights, like three hours a night, people in the bar drinking, they may be listening, but even still, I need to get some stuff. So I was going through my records and the radio and just, oh, I could do that song and this song. And I remembered about this song, My Life, by this guy, Billy Joel. And 
to say I knew nothing else about him is not an understatement. All I knew was that it was the same guy that had had Uptown Girl out about a year and a half, maybe two years earlier, 1983, Uptown Girl was. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge, huge hit. And at the time, passed me by. Didn't I neither liked it or disliked it. It wasn't something that caught me at the time. I don't mm. you know, it's funny why, I don't know. But I, I ignored it. But I loved my life. Every time that song came on the radio, I don't even remember hearing The Longest Time. I don't remember hearing Tell Her About It at the time. These were big hits also at the time. Mm. I don't remember. I just, you know, I, don't know, I was just, you know, going through changes and just practicing and learning stuff and playing in my own little bands and stuff. Anyway, I wanted my life to learn for this new gig. And I remembered that Katie, well, Katie's parents had my life on the greatest hits, one yeah. and two, the grey one. And I thought, you know, this is a perfect excuse. An excuse just to go around like, oh, how you doing? Yeah, nice to see you again. How's it going? Yeah, you know, because it'd been a while, a few yeah. months, maybe a year. I don't, I can't remember. But um, so I went around there um, on my bike and I rode around there and uh, I did. I splashed on my Brute 33. I remember thinking this is a, a good opportunity to see if I can woo her back. It didn't go to plan at all because I got there and she wasn't pleased to see me at all. She was in and she was the only one in. She wouldn't let me in. And I said, can I, oh, hi, you know, so I quickly said, can I borrow um, the cassette? I've come around, you know, what do you want? Literally, what? What? Oh, well, no, no, no. There's a real reason. I want to, I've got this new gig and I'd like to borrow um, the cassette you have of my life because I'd like to learn. All right, wait there, you know. And she was, so she went in and came back within a few seconds and put a cassette in my hand and slammed the door, you know. Yeah, see you, bye. I was like, oh, okay. You know, so embarrassed, you know, put it in, in the bag or in my, whatever it was and just got on my bike and whizzed around. I was just a few seconds round there when I pulled it out just to have a look. And I'm literally I'm doing no handed on the bike and I'm looking for my life. And I wasn't thinking, I hadn't noticed what she'd given it, but it wasn't on there because she'd actually given me an Innocent Man album cassette. And of course, I recognised Uptown Girl on there and I was just too embarrassed to go back. I wasn't going to go back. So I took it home and I thought, oh, well, you know, it's a nice cassette. I'll, uh, I'll go and have a listen to it, you know. New music, put it on. I had a Walkman in those days. It was, you know, they were big, weren't they? Headphones on. And um, I pressed play, you know, later on that night. It was that day, I remember, because I was quite excited about hearing, you know, this guy. And now I had a cassette, I had, you know of this guy who'd sung my life. I wonder yeah. what else he's done, you know. I press play and uh, Easy Money comes on. Thought, this is, wow, this is just, whoa. God, God, it's just rocking, it was just rocking. And this voice that didn't sound like the guy on my life mm. is singing. And I'm like, wow, is this, is this, is this Billy Joel, wow. Good. And the next song, second song is An Innocent Man. That, dum, dum, that, you know, it was sort of close. It was close to the Elvis stuff that I was loving. You know, it had that Latin groove, being an Italian with that Latin stuff. I loved it. And this is beautiful voice and his. It was just, I thought, this is amazing. I'm loving this. Then the a cappella, The Longest Time, comes on. Again, old school 50s doo-wop, which I was loving. I was into the Ink Spots and and uh, the Mills Brothers, Jordan Ayres had sung with Elvis. Couldn't believe it. Loved it. And then track number four, This Night, comes on. Do, 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 do. Didn't I say? This young voice, this lovely, light, lovely voice, and this lovely, very familiar, old school rock and roll, 12 8 groove goes on, and he sings, and I'm loving it. And then it hits the chorus and it opens up with this glorious, romantic. Now, I'd be 
you've got to imagine, right? Now, I didn't have an older brother or an older sister. So there was no older brother passing down David Bowie mm. to me. There was no older brother passing down Jackson Brown or the Doobie Brothers. I was I was the oldest of my of my family, you know, my two younger sisters. And so therefore the music that was passed down to me was was my mum and dad. Mm. And mum and dad loved the Beatles and and they loved Queen and stuff, but being Italian, Southern Italians, there was a lot of that music in the house. Perry Como was there, Engelbert Humperdinck, Tom Jones. I was brought up with that sort of, you know, radio was always on, so I had yep. the modern hits, but there was all that stuff. So I was into this lush, beautiful arranging that all those great Andy Williams artists, you know, it's all cool now. Mm. But, you know, back then it wasn't really cool for a 14-year-old to be into Andy Williams. You know, it wasn't even cool to be into ABBA at that time and I loved ABBA <laughs> so so I was brought I, I had an ear for this lush harmony and mm. lush arrangements and there it was in this rock and roll star who'd been on MTV was on Top of the Pops what's this guy doing covering all that old stuff and I, and it was modern production I, I absolutely couldn't believe it how wonderful it was. Mm. And then the moment for me was it's building second chorus. Then it goes off into this saxophone solo and these beautiful harmonies, backing vocals, this sax, tenor saxophone, which I'd loved, obviously, you know, because of my love of Elvis Presley's boots, Randolph on that. And, and then it changed key and he comes in and I remember it like it was 25 minutes ago. This night, is my world it's only you and i he's singing up there now because the song's changed tomorrow is such a long time away day that little twiddle that little romantic little sort of classical italian neapolitan singer that i'd been brought up with there it was, and he placed that note, which of, of course is a Beethoven melody. Mm. Even in that itself, it's European. This was this American basically taking a European melody, and you know, being an Italian, it was it's all tied in. Mm. There was yeah. that is an already romantic melody, and what and this rock and roll star is singing it to me with all this stuff going on around it, and the rock and roll. I just, I remember it hitting me so hard. The and the strings straight after and wrong time away. Till you both this night can last forever. Bang! Fireworks went off inside of me, and literally, I don't think they've ever stopped. Hmm. Nothing, not Elvis, not anything else, has ever touched me musically as hard. It was just the right time. Mm. You know, it was just the right thing at the right time. I had that moment and I was set. I was set right at that moment. I became instantly a new young man. Mm. And there was only one way I could go from that. And that was to find out who this guy was, get everything he'd ever done. And when I did get it and found there were ridiculously beautiful songs from other stuff, you know, other things that made me go, oh, he's done it again, he's done it again and again and again. Where did that melody come from? How did he get from that chord? And then, of course, it opened up. And he was so, so far advance, in advance of me and my harmonic knowledge. It was, it was, it was literally, as I say, a master class after master class. Every three and a half minutes was just um, a master class. And that's, that's, how I became really who I've become as myself, as a singer, as an artist, as a writer, as a performer. I really have really ultimately no one else to thank but Billy Joel. And that little twist of fate that day. And that little twist of fate. So thank you, Katie. Katie, can, can you... Uh... <laughs> I, st I don't even, even know if I have still have the cassette, but... um. I can tell the story, you can keep it if you want or not. But um, her, her, um, Katie came to see the show, and I tell the story in the show. Yeah. We did a show at Leicester Square, and uh, 
and she was there. And it was quite weird telling the story with Katie there because I said, right, this is the girl I'm talking about, you know. And um, as I say, she's an incredible artist, uh, fantastic actress. But her mum and dad came to see the show. And I told the story, <laughs> I'm telling the story, told the story and, and beautifully timed because her dad had a, a great sense of humour anyway. Just as I finish the story about it and I'm just about to go into this night, he shouts from the back, can I have my cassette back? <laughs> from the back. Uh, it's very funny. But yeah, there's the story. So uh, four years, four years down the line, uh, still going strong, still selling out. Hmm. Uh, for you, 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 I mean, thank you. Like, yeah, like you said, you know, originally, initially, there was smaller audiences, and it's built and built and built. Yeah. But the reactions, the reactions that the show gets, people coming to see you afterwards, yeah. coming back to see the show again and again and again and again and again. What? And again. How's that evolved? How's that sort of just the the general reaction of people yeah. To, yeah. to the show? I remember saying to you, "There's a gap in the market here." I reckon there are a whole load of people out there that have forgotten how much they love Billy Joel's music. And I, I'm so grateful mm. that I had the opportunity to put a show on like this and find those people. Yeah. And I was right. We were right. There are people out there who have not had enough of Billy Joel, who've forgotten. A number of people that have said to me after a show, I didn't know that was by Billy Joel. I didn't know New York State of Mind. I didn't know that was Billy Joel. She was always a woman. I didn't know it was Billy. I'm like, uh, for me, I'm like, seriously? Mm. But they didn't. Mm. Because, you know, as I say, it's not their job to know the stuff that we know. Is that They do their stuff, I do my stuff. It's So to have found people and to see the reaction that we get. Um, I'm not one... I, 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 I hate sitting in an audience when the performer says, I want to see everybody up on their feet. I want to see ev all the hands up in the air. It, it makes me feel uncomfortable. So I never say that on stage. I like it if they did stand up, but I'm, I never want to say that. Mm. So to have whatever... We've had a standing ovation, a, a, what I believe is a real standing ovation, every single show from the day we started on March the 20th, 2014. That was the first show, East mm. Grinstead, Checker Mead Theatre. Standing ovation in front of those 72 people that night. And yes, we are now starting to sell out nearly everywhere we go. We're starting to do two nights. There are some theatres that want us for three nights. I can't sing the show more than three nights in a row at a quality, the quality that I want to. Yeah. So I can't physically do the show more than three nights. It's a two and a half hour show. There's all those songs in it. And it's, and you know, thanks, Billy, but it's not a straightforward, yeah. you know, it's not... Well, he had 30 or 40 years to uh, yeah. <laughs> sing yeah. those songs. You've got two exactly. and a half hours. But, you know, the way he writes, mm. the, the, you know, the, it's up and down. It's not It's not just straight, you know, you ain't know the murder hound dog. <laughs> Crack, you know, which is basically three notes, you know. No, these, these move like symphonies, these melodies, and you have to sing them. Uh, in a certain way to make them work, mm. so you have to be on it. And I so so to do to start doing two and three shows in places, and to have these incredible, wonderful music loving people. I've always believed that if you were a Billy Joel fan, if your ear had been turned by Billy Joel, you had a knowledge. You had, you were in a little club with me. There's a club, <laughs> and I know I'm in it. But I knew there were other people that, that got Billy Joel. There are When I confidently declare I believe he's the greatest, it gets a round of applause because there are some people who agree with me. Of course, there are some people that go, I don't know what he's talking about. You know, I prefer Elton John. But that's OK, because my job is to, to sort of put it on a plate for you and go, you know, have a listen to this and see what you think now. You know, he's pretty good, isn't he? Yeah, this is pretty clever stuff, isn't it? This is, and it's catchy. Mm. It's not alienating, you know. You know, it's not heavy jazz or heavy fusion. It's still pop music. So, to have found those club members, and to be in a position to spread what I believe, and you know, there's a little bit of a soapbox thing about it for me because I do believe that that colour, 
that variety in pop music has disappeared. Mm. It's gone. It's it's been dissipating for years, you know. And and uh, you know, if I know there's a lovely movement against it where people encourage young kids to pick up a guitar or play the drums or play the piano. It's great. We need that. And this is, you know, I wanted to, you know, sing Billy Joel songs, but also there was there is a bit of a underlying message for me, which is, let's not let this beautiful music die, and and let that twelve year old kid down there who's listening, who's singing along to Uptown Girl, who wasn't the last time he was here a year ago, if he turns into a musician, then his ears have been turned into this beautiful. You can progress through the chords and through the sounds of music and still make it into a, the pop idiom. Mm. That's a partly of what I'm trying to get across as well. So to have people dancing is a thrill. To have people singing is a thrill. To have people coming back over and over. We've got people coming back now who have seen the show into the, you know, into the 30s and 40 times, 50 times. Mm. People were, were taking the show internationally for the first time this year. There's busloads of people going over to Holland for the first time. There are other areas of Europe that have come knocking yeah. that would like the show. Why? Well, I'd love it if Billy wanted to do it himself. I would love it. I'd be, I'd be the first one in line. I was there at Wembley when he played there, you know, last year. I love it. Mm. I wish he wanted to do more, but he doesn't. And because I believe in music and and the variety of music and and this beautiful music of which Billy is definitely, you know, uh, an advocate for, uh, I have taken it upon myself because I passionately believe in it and that it shouldn't die and that young people should hear great old songs as well as the new stuff. There's some great new stuff as well. Combine it together. Let's not be afraid of playing a few more chords. Let's, let's, put, let's shove in a minor seven flat five in there. It's okay. Learn it. It's, great. it's a lovely chord on the guitar. Learn it. You know, learn that major seven, major nine chord, that 13 chord against your straight major chords. Beautiful. Let's mix it up a bit. That's what I'm trying. And, and to be given the opportunity to do this. Hmm. Uh, if Billy doesn't want to do it, I really feel somebody has to do it. So I feel it's my it's been my calling yeah. all these years. All these years, I wanted just to do a show, but now it's become something more, mm. you know, for me. Because I really, uh, you know, and in it, it's, it's a massive, massive thrill to see these people who get it, mm. who have remembered how much they love. The, the, I, honestly, the amount of times people have said to me, I've got, is it... Vinyl. I didn't really want to come tonight. I didn't know what to expect. You know, I didn't know what to expect. I'm going to get straight up in the loft. I've got turnstiles mm. up there and I've got Street Life Serenade on vinyl. I was like, oh man, he's going to go and get it. And I get emails and I get messages from people saying, yeah, I can't stop listening to this song and, you know, and, and stuff. So he's probably seeing his sales going up in the UK. He's like, what's going on over there? There's this. Well, he must be. He yeah. must be seeing <laughs> a, a be spike sort of... in his downloads. Yeah, absolutely. Like, well, th there must be, you know, and, and, you know, even if it's a little bit, it, it's still, it must be there. That's it. And so, well, okay, well then, um, with that in mind then, which people are obviously didn't remember that they were Billy Joel songs, forgotten the songs, sort of like those songs, which yeah. which one of those songs do you feel up there performing them? Which ones are getting the reactions or getting mm -hmm. the... Oh, that one you did with the, you know, that. There's one song. It's the lullaby. Mm. Good night, my angel. It's it's my favourite ever song by anybody. Mm. It's my favourite song, and uh, I loved it when it came out. I loved it in 1993. It was on the River of Dreams album. I loved it a lot. Then I became a father eight years ago. And uh, I listened to that song again and it took on a whole new meaning, the lyric. Yeah. And however difficult that song is to sing, and I do find it difficult to sing, uh, I have to do it. Emotionally. Emotionally, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, mm. emotionally, because I can't, I can't, you know, I, I have to try not to picture Marcella's face too much. He's, you know, because Billy wrote it about his little girl. Mm. So, 
I, I really feel in that song. And, and it's that song, I think, the most that has touched people. Yeah. For me, it's the one that people who are who definitely didn't come as Billy Joel fans, who go, "Wow, you know, that was that that was a song." I've got to tell you, you know, mm. that was a song, and and it's the incredible the amount of people that talk to me about that particular song mm. and uh, how they'd never heard it, or they had heard it but not really heard it, and they've gone home and listened to it. And then I've had people that have written to me that have said we use that for this occasion and sad occasions and, mm. you know, and happy occasions. And uh, it seems that Billy wrote an extraordinarily awesome song there, yeah. which I, from my perspective, is the one song that I do in the show that people didn't know. People mm. didn't know was Billy Joel and... Uh, have touched more people, I think, than any other song I perform. And it comes at a really lovely point in the show as well. It's, a per it's perfectly placed in there. <laughs> Even if we say so ourselves. Well, <laughs> if you wasn't going to mention it, I was. <laughs> but it, it just, you know, you've heard all of this music and it's, it's almost at the point where, you, you okay, I get yeah. it, I get it, you, brilliant, you, I get great. it, I get it. And then, hang on a minute, bang. There's, there's one this, more thing yeah, there's, you there's need one, to know yeah, before exactly. we... Take the cork out of the bottle and rattle through the hits. We yeah. didn't start the fire, the river of dreams. Uptown girl, tell her about it. Piano man, you may be right. There's one last little yeah. chapter I want to read to you. Yeah. And if this doesn't do it, now you've got the whole picture, mm. then I've done my best. And even that, I mean, you, you know, you can easily just sit there and sing all the songs, put all the songs together and do a, do a concert. But even from our point of view, putting that, together in that way finding which songs work where where do we yeah. put that where do we put that even that creating the show it was a, it was a, a perfect song in a way it just delivers a, a real sort of theatrical punch yes. literally yes um yeah that that kind of helped shape that second half it was like the like you say before the cork comes out of the yeah. bottle it's like yeah. we need one last little twist of yeah a sort of plot if you like Exactly. And it's just, it's and a story. That, exactly. Every yeah. song we chose was chosen to help yeah. tell the full, the full picture, the picture full story. of who this guy is. So mm. if you want a bite size, a bite size experience of who Billy Joel is, Billy Joel is allowed to go out and do a few hits and a load of albums, mm. a load of album tracks. Right. So he can do what he likes. It's his music. I'm going to love that. Mm. But if you want a, a a two and a half hour lesson. Yeah. Which it is. As to who frankly. this guy is and how brilliant this guy is. Uh, I'm very, very proud of what we wrote mm. and, and how we shaped that show and, uh, and your idea to open the second half with Goodnight Saigon. I mean, who, who would, you know, that's a, you know, that's, that's a, that's a down song. Well, no, you know? it, well, it is, but heavy. again, it, it going like back theatrically, to theatrically. That's yeah, your theatrically, theatric, that's and, your acting, and the storytelling theatric. side of it. You, you, the helicopter on the album starts that off. You know, yeah. it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you were washing up in the kitchen and, and you had the album on, that it it pulls your ears in. So, yeah. again, it's a perfect time to do it. Everyone's just come back from the bar. Lights go down. Up comes the, yeah. the helicopter. Yeah, and it, it's not. You know, you could you could have put five or six different songs there to open the show but he's, even that he it was put on a plate for us you yeah. know all those years ago that it was written yeah we would have no idea that perfect we'll open the second half with with a helicopter yeah having finished brilliant and although on the <laughs> dvd that people see here it all melds in into one i think it's very clear to see that that was the yeah. end of one act and the beginning of the next. so scenes from italian restaurant into good night saigon work great yeah you know yeah definitely um, yeah, 